the, the, the great joy of working at Mayor Brown for as many years as I have on as many cases as I have is that in the commercial cases as well as in the criminal cases, the depth of knowledge and the, the astonishing intellectual capacity of the people that you work with and rely upon is without ever a, a moment where you're concerned that someone on the team is a weak link. Beyond uh, you know, the usual wisdom that it makes sense to you know, prepare your case or know your facts or, or know the law, this case, you know, the outcome is tr almost strictly dependent upon my ability to convince the other lawyers and they in turn to convince their clients that we wanted to go with a common strategy. You don't always have to be likable. You can, you can, you, if you just have your own defendant to worry about, you can, you know, whatever personality you need to persuade your defendant. But you better be likable if you're trying to convince a room full of lawyers that you, you want them to do it your way. I was the lead Mayor Brown lawyer for a criminal defendant in a large antitrust criminal case brought by the federal government against a number of people in the dairy industry for fixing prices for milk to school children. The interesting challenge and complication of the case was that there were a number of defendants, including a corporate defendant, but largely uh, people who were individually represented by lawyers other than myself. It was quite expensive to send milk out to the various school districts. The, the milk companies lost money in doing that, but on the other hand, they wanted to, the milk companies were very interested in creating the next generation of people who would be drinking their product. Um, and so we emphasized really the, uh, the benefit to the school kids of the milk companies sending their trucks off into the hinterlands um, and uh, providing them with something that ordinarily was not economically sensible for the companies to engage in. Because the outcome was so completely successful for all of the defendants, statistically it's, it's a rarity. Uh, generally speaking, federal criminal prosecutions uh, largely result in uh, most people, or at least some of the multiple defendants, being found guilty. Uh, to turn that on its head and have a complete victory for the defendants left everybody with a professional sense of elation. You know, having worked together in ways that are counterintuitive to how a lot of lawyers operate, we had what was called a common defense or often called a joint defense privilege, something that required each of our defendants to agree that they would, we would be allowed to share information among the lawyers. What we did not want to do is have five people get sending the same message in basically the same way to the jurors. We would have lost their attention very quickly and it would have looked, frankly, a little bit uh, pre-cooked or, or perhaps less genuine. Uh, the decision was made by our group that one of the defendants uh, was a more powerful witness than the others. And it was decided that he would be the only witness who actually testified in the case. He had a terrific background, including a, a very strong and honorable war record. Uh, he was a naturally sympathetic person. He conveyed things well, and so he was our message carrier. One of the great lessons of this case was the, the phenomenal importance of the opening statement as opposed to the closing argument. Uh, you know, most film and TV versions of trials love to concentrate on the final arguments of the lawyers uh, as some kind of a crescendo or climax. It's too late to wait for the closing. Um, and even as a veteran trial lawyer, I, I really learned my lesson. You know, the real time and effort often in a trial is not devoted to what you learned in law school or what they teach you in legal seminars. It's the interaction with the actual people you're involved in and figuring out how to persuade them to do what you'd like them to do.